All right, welcome everyone to this radcast of the Solution Club at the beginning of the new world. We've just been hanging here without recording for uh, almost an hour. Um, just getting caught up here and uh, we got some good ideas flowing. So who would like to start? Just jump in. And we're waiting for Jack. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Emery. Good to be here, Dan. Welcome, everybody. Great another, to have you. Great to have you here, Emery. Another another day for solutions. Exactly. <laughs> wow. Let's get to them. Yeah. I'll just leave something for so in the chat. I'll leave you a link. We were talking a little bit about part about uh, the virus there and the, the vaccines. So I just want to leave you a link so you could uh, take your time, go through the couple of videos. Thank uh, you. I'll, um, if I'm, if anybody's interested in. Just out of curiosity, what they're doing with the horseshoe crabs. Um, just go to YouTube and put in horseshoe crabs uh, blood and you'll find out what they're doing. Well, they're up to no good as far as I can see. It was that actually I first came across it um, in an article in the Guardian, which was in the Guardian Guardian about a week ago, and I just followed it through some time afterwards, and they actually had the picture on it. I just found it absolutely unbelievable. I'm you know just as a thing, it was just so weird. It was straight out of a science fiction um, novel. Yeah, it's like science fiction, but it's also like 007. It's like we're in a 007 movie here. In some cases. These horseshoe crabs, they're already space age looking, you know? And I never even seen one. I, to be honest with you, I didn't even know there was such a thing as a horseshoe crab. And then seeing them all strapped up, it, it was very similar to how, you, how we're strapped up in an aeroplane, you know? And, but long lines in the laboratory and these bottles underneath and this strange blue blood. And it's just like, like I say, well, who the hell could even dream of this? It's a strange, wrong dream to have, isn't it? It's the wrong dream. It's, it's so dysfunctional, but it really shows that we've gotten so far from source and we've lost our connection to nature. We don't understand that all living beings are sentient souls. They're sentient. That means they're alive, they have consciousness, and they have a soul. <laughs> and we've gotten so used to this idea that the earth is there for us that the, the universe and the earth was created for humans which is a a misconception it's it's a lie it is not the truth that we have been indoctrinated into this belief where we only see nature as a product so how much money can we make off of it how could this serve us how could we use this instead of holding everything with reverence and living in harmony and getting back to source and getting back to well-being and not having these dysfunctional polluted lives that are creating sickness in the first place so that's where the work has to be done it's called re-education of humanity <clears throat> in order for us to come into right relationship with nature right relationship with creation right relationship with self and with each other thank you
just want to ask you something, Jamin. Uh, did you, did you, uh, in, did you in your studies uh, study Pluto? Uh, the planet. Well, well, there's. Oh, what an idiot I am! That's Pluto. Hey, can I can I can I give you a little bit of feedback? Plato, Plato, right. Plato, Plato, Plato. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, first of all, please, please, please don't call yourself an idiot, brother. Um, well, times I tell uh, you. No, 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 no. I, I I hear you. I'm I'm just giving you a little little friendly uh, feedback um, because when we say those words, um, you're right. We hear them. Our, we ourselves, whoever's saying them also hears them and it comes in uh, from a trusted source ourselves. So we, we anyway, um, but enough on that. But my question was, uh, did you, did you study Plato and Aristotle and the difference um, between the two? You know, I, I studied a bit of Plato. The only one I studied formally was, was Plato. Um, when I studied rhetoric as an undergrad. Um, and, uh, Aristotle, I didn't study. I'd learned about him when I was studying physics, um, but he was just sort of brought up as an example of uh, someone who, you know, came up with a bunch of different theories, but none of them were true uh, in the physical realm, et cetera. But uh, anyway, why, why did, did you think of anything specific from Plato? Uh, no, I was, I was thinking that you had a, a, a great understanding about uh, those two uh and and the their the way they have described um you know humanity and uh, what what their perspective and understanding about about it is you know and uh i think it's like apparently they are two sides of a coin uh like one is a north pole and one is a south pole of the way you look at how things are in the world. So I was just wondering if you had any any great insights into that, you know? Um, I mean, the far-ranging far -ranging insights could, could lead you in all kinds of directions, you know? So, I'm, I'm Ray, I'm Ray, could you just, um North Pole, Aristotle, South Pole, Plato thinking. Could you put it in a nutshell? Aristotle in a nutshell, then Plato in a nutshell. Then well, we've got a map of what we're talking about. Well, that's what that's sort of like what I'm 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 leading to. I guess is that the Plato understanding is a more of a godly nature, and Aristotle is more is more of a, well, you know, there is no God in the picture, really. It's, it's, um, they're two opposing things, but they both have some good points about it. You know what I mean? So it's complicated, unless you're a real master at, at, uh, at studying, uh, studying the whole thing. Well, you don't, uh, in a way, we don't need to be a master because I remember studying Plato at, at college, but the thing is, I don't necessarily retain loads of things. But what's lovely nowadays is we can go back and check up. Like I can watch a whole really, I can choose from a whole load of vids on Plato. I can choose from a whole load of vids on Aristotle. I can listen to a, an amazing lecture from Harvard and it's all on YouTube. So I can go back if I have an idea, oh, I think it was about this, I can go back, I can check on it and reboot what I know, if you like. Yeah, well, that's, that's I guess, what I'm working on, too, is, is what you just said, you know. Um, I mean, I didn't really go, go through uh, school learning that, all that much about it, but nowadays with, with having the ability to uh, do all, all of that on uh, you know, over the internet, I think it's beneficial. It could be something very beneficial to uh, to revisit these these two individuals 
they had a lot of interesting concepts. So I'm doing more and more as I have more and more energy to do it. Emre, somebody um, called me uh, an autodidact. <laughs> I just like, I'm a bit hungry for knowledge on things. So at one time I used to have like piles of books all the time and I was reading all of them at the same time. And, you know, like I really, really read the books. And um, now it's like YouTube was my university. Yeah, it's it's incredible, and it's also <clears throat> part of the um, the crazy making of all this because when we, you know, look for anything, you know, we'll find information on it. So it's like, hey, we know this, and we know that humanity knows collectively. We do because somebody knows it, right? Even if it's a YouTube video with zero views, and you watch it, and you're the first person viewing it, um, regardless of how many people watch it it is known because the speaker knows it right so here's how i see kind of i was about to say the crux of our problem but it's really one of the cruxes um but one of the cruxes as i see it is all this information is known but there's no sense making right it's like a massive library but nobody's in it right all the information is there but it's not integrated right it's not made sense of and um what we're all used to is as an individual i need to accumulate knowledge here right it's like a hunter gatherer who's just out picking nuts and berries but only for myself right and i when i get back to the village they're like hey jamin whoa How's it going? How'd it go? I, oh, I didn't find anything. Meanwhile, you know, my, my satchel is bulging, but I'm just hoarding it for myself. So I don't, I don't, I don't tend to think of what I do as knowledge hoarding, um, Jamin. I see it as um, various inspirations and they're going to sort of like, okay, I watched a bit on this obscure thing and then I watched a bit on this and then I might have these little eureka tiny little eureka moments as part of a progress pro progr progressional thinking whereas oh yeah i remember that and that and then you suddenly put those two together so that's like my, my little mini collective intelligence going on thanks to youtube or thanks to various books i read but we're all doing that to some extent but now we're widening it out i mean in a way, YouTube is our collective, is a collective intelligence. But like you say, it's, it's how we bring the strands together. And we don't know what we're going to bring together yet. You know, we're, we're in process. Um, and we, we want to get this bigger giant intelligence, this, you know, to move on to the next way of being that's beyond all this hermit, um, horseshoe crab crap. It's hot blood not crap, blood, beyond horseshoe crab blood. That's going to be my way of thinking of it now. Beyond the horseshoe crab blood. That, that's how I'm going to think of it for me. I'm not asking anyone to take it on. <laughs> yeah. So that sounds yeah. great. Yeah, yeah, good stuff. You know, so j just to be clear, I wasn't commenting on your process. I think that's a beautiful thing. Your sense making by assimilating and integrating uh, different, you know, uh, viewpoints and analysis and et cetera, et cetera. I think that's a beautiful thing. I'm just talking more globally as humanity as a whole, the way that we've been brought up to relate with information is not necessarily as something to share, 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 but no, no, no. You learn all that you can so that you can then leverage that for either a career or starting a business or something 
but you're, you're holding certain cards that you don't just give away freely, right? Um, I mean, lawyers are a great example, right? If you, you, if you sit down with a skilled lawyer and explain your situation, probably in a few minutes, they can give you great advice, right? But, that's, but they're not in the business of giving great advice. In fact, they're not in the business of giving, period. They're in the business of taking. Okay, you want my help here? Sign this ten thousand dollar retainer, and then um, yeah, go ahead. Damon, bring yeah. those two two things together. You mentioned to Emre, you said, "Don't call yourself stupid, because the words you say about yourself matter." And then taking this um, sharing information thing, those two things came up in this conversation. Well, the other day I said to my son. I, I've always been overlooked and um, I said, look, every job I've been in, people run off with my idea and, and they always say it was theirs and that, like, they think it's theirs. I'm an ideas person and it, it's very blatant, but I see now it actually came from my philosophy that I sort of created that situation because I believe in information sharing. So I was never in the right culture in terms of the job I was in, where that was, um, you know, so somebody's into the, oh, I'll capitalize on everything I can get in order to climb up the ladder. And then I'm this twat, you know, as they probably saw me as a twat who was into this information sharing, who wasn't capitalizing on it. Um, and then he said, well, think of what he said. My son said to me, well, think of what you've just said about yourself. You're overlooked. So you're going to go around always being overlooked because you've said that. I said, okay. I said, um, I'm acknowledged. And it was one of those nice little moments because one of the things I like to be is acknowledged. <laughs> and I feel I get very little of that. And then I rubbed it in even further. I said, do you know what? I said, this gypsy came to the door once and I was quite young. And she said, oh my dear, you've been overlooked. <laughs> so, the gypsy's narrative <laughs> was in there as well but um so yeah bringing those two things together you know i got overlooked because i was giving it all away but then i can check i can change that narrative i'm not overlooked i'm acknowledged there, there we go i'm acknowledged thank you my son beautiful beautiful so thank you yeah well i want to acknowledge you so um there are hey uncle frank welcome uncle frank uh says he's connecting to audio hey okay all right uncle frank can hear me great um we're just having a good discussion here um uncle frank so from london england says hello to you she's there in london we've got emory in montreal canada we are recording and live streaming on Twitch, just so everybody knows. And um, all right. Um, anyway, so we're, I was, I was, um, oh yeah, so I was just uh, in the process of acknowledging you that um, when you're here and when you're speaking and a part of the conversation, it just, really lifts the conversation and what comes to mind for me are are the words divine feminine which were taught to me by melissa and melissa who's on the call now and also myra and jackie who will be joining us shortly hopefully fairly soon she should be arriving anytime the three those uh, you three ladies melissa myra and uh, jackie put together the program, The Divine Feminine, which is on the block party that we all know about. And anyway, that's what comes to mind when I hear you speaking, so, um, is The Divine Feminine. Oh, thank you. Yeah. And I can tell you, and I'd love to hear Emery's uh, thoughts on this, but I just have this feeling in me when I hear you speaking, that it's just a feeling of peace and like, that um, I'm, I just feel like I'm in a wonderful family sitting by the fire after a wonderful dinner and drinking some delicious hot cider, right? It's such a welcoming, 
nurturing uh, feeling. And that for me is one of the things that you bring uh, to this. And when I say one of the things, see, one of the things, see how our mental frame, how our philosophical paradigm, we break things down, we separate, 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 because really what you bring is so. So is not a basket of separate things. So is one being, right? Anyway, I just that, that's kind of a little tangent. Um, but um, I just really want to acknowledge you. So, and I'd love to hear Emery's thoughts on this because he's also had the privilege of hanging with you for many hours. And, uh, but not to put you on the spot, Emery. I'm just saying it's um, when, um, when men feel something, it's often universal, it's often shared. So I just wanted to uh, give others the opportunity to jump in on that. No, I'll, I'll jump in. I, I, I like hanging with, with everybody. You know, I like to come, I like to come in and, uh, you know, hear, hear what everyone has, uh, has on their mind, you know, and uh, relay, you know, try to, uh, you know, participate in their in the lives of uh, one another. You know, to uh, to the extent that's possible. You know, given uh, the technology that we have, it's uh, yeah. I mean, for the most part, we agree on a lot of things, so we have a lot of things in common. And uh, even when we don't speak. Uh, you know, we don't have to uh, dot everybody's I and cross everybody's T, you know. Uh, yeah. so, but I'm sure people eventually understand that uh, we're, we're, in, um, we're in a very good resonance with one another, you know. Otherwise, we wouldn't be participating in any... In any way, really, we come in and we just fly out, right? But uh, I think I see, for the most part, you know, uh, those that do connect with uh, with each other tend to tend to stick around. So let that be a guiding uh, a guiding thought. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. That's it. It's 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 all about connection. And um you know, it's easy for it's easy for us to acknowledge. Oh, y yes, sweetheart, go ahead. Um go ahead and finish Jamin. I just wanted to say something after you. Sorry. Yeah, no, no, no. No problem. I was just saying it's it's often easy for us to acknowledge others and say, oh wow, you know, I I love So's contributions, I love Emery's contributions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it's often hard for us to acknowledge ourselves. And that's part of what's important about acknowledging um others. And this really gets right to the heart of sense making and collective intelligence. You see, I'm really not the best person to judge Jamin or to evaluate Jamin or to appreciate Jamin or whatever. It's really others who can do that appreciating. And it, it helps so much to get that reflected back at yourself. We've all experienced it. We all love and need acknowledgement and encouragement. Um, anyway, that's all I had to say. Go ahead, uh, Melissa. Well, one of the things I wanted to say to shine a positive light this morning in this dark time that we're in is I really congratulate all of you and thank all of you for turning up here week after week after week for your dedication, your thoughtfulness, your reverence, and sharing your self sharing the beauty that and your gifts that you carry inside yourself and I learned some we all learn so much from each other so I love your European soul you know I love that the English depth of soul that you bring and Emery I really appreciate what you bring as well this wisdom both of you carry so just keep turning up because you know that's how we're going to bring change right is all of us turning up with our gifts and keep even if 
in the face of all the challenges and everything that, you know, self-doubt or whatever we're going through, just keep shining your light because we need that light. Thank you. Um, yeah. Well, you know, shining a light, shining a light is uh, like uh, exercising a muscle, you know, we need, we need to, I mean, we're, we're exercising, getting stronger and more able to, to do what, what, um, you know, what we must, right? So this is this this technology here that we've got in front of us it's it's you know takes a bit to get used to right so you know and the way we're communicating now it's 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 not something you get right away maybe some do but i i i tend to believe that the majority of people don't really catch on immediately and 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 we need to exercise this this newfound uh possibility and 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 uh realize that you know it's it's a it can be very enabling right the more you the more you practice the more you get the stronger you get right i think um the results are going to be in very interesting i think and that's and that's the strength of this collective uh, uh, collective uh, intelligence process is you know seeing that happen yeah to to actually see that happen right in front of us as we participate you, you yeah i i th I think um you know uh but I think the, a really good idea is that length of the block party, that it's 24 hours because every um, conversation you have now, I, I don't like the word nowadays, but I do mean nowadays, is like, oh, gotta go. Oh yeah, oh, that was really interesting. See, see you, you know, it's never, you're never allowed to be still in the conversation and be dormant for long enough to have a new thought or to ponder. So I think, you know, just like we've got the slow travel movement, the, the slow this movement, the slow fashion movement, we, this is good. This is the slow conversation movement. It's important you have to have time to hone a thought. You know, it, you, it can be nothing. You know what it's like, you know, if you're in that kind of, thinking state oh and you go dead for about you might go dead for about 10 hours and then suddenly you have a thought and it in a way the thought happened because you were allowed to be dead for a while i love it so i love the way you put that the slow conversation movement um that's exactly it because until and unless we slow down and both give ourselves the opportunity to articulate what we have inside, right? And give ourselves the opportunity to really listen and slow down and listen. Um, you know, I remember a couple of weeks ago, you know, I was all energized and talk, 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 and Emery started to say something. And I started interrupting you, Emery, you remember that? And, uh, you know, Emery finally had to catch me and say, dude, you know, let me finish. And I was like, dang, you know, so sometimes, you know, that shadow, whether we learned it in childhood or whatever, um, you know, for me creeps in and I really need to catch it and slow down. It's almost like meditating. Not that I'm some great practitioner of meditation, mind you. Um, I'd like to be, and I'm kind of chipping away at it, but it's kind of like that where you just really have to slow down and clear and you know check the ego at the door kind of thing anyway just wanted to comment that going on mute um didn't um i didn't 
get to hear the whole of uh, Will Tell's talk. I, I did watch his little vids afterwards. I watched ones that weren't exactly on what he was talking about, but I sort of vaguely remember him going into a hut and just eating rice or something in a hut. You know, that was, I think it might have been him trying to find out, out his purpose. You you were all there in the conversation, I think, but was that was that what he was doing? He was like giving himself that time out, that space like a hermit to to be to find out what he thought and what, what he wanted to do and where he was and what his aims were. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. And, um, you know, I mean, and what a, what a rich gift to, to give oneself. Um, and uh, I really think we all need that to give ourselves a time out. And like, you know, for example, in Australia, um, it's pretty well known that the Aborigines, part of their culture is that um, I don't know if this is young people generally or just young men, that I don't know, but I certainly know that young men, it's part of their growing up that they go on a walkabout and just leave home and just go and travel. And um, because that's part of the culture, right? You know, here in the United States, if uh, someone was just walking about, from one place to the other without possessions, without a job, without whatever, we'd say, oh, and not we, not me, but, you know, a lot of the culture would say, oh, a vagrant, you know, a useless drifter, right, just leeching off society. Uh, here, let me, uh, oh, they're brown skin, great, let me kneel on his neck until he dies kind of thing, uh, being a bit cynical here uh, in the moment. But you get my point. We all need that, but how many of us are given uh, or give ourselves? <clears throat> I mean, Will Tuttle being, you know, uh, a privileged white male uh, in at near the, uh, what many consider an apex of Western civilization, you know, in the 70s, 80s, whatever, you know, he could give himself that, <laughs> that luxury. Nobody's going to kneel on his neck, right? Um, and but I'm just saying it's something that we all need, but not all of us are given. Um, and um, I, yeah, go ahead. I think I think Jamin, it's not you'll never be given it. You have to take it. But also, I think no, it, he's definitely got that privilege. He's white, long hair, what what have you, a bloke. But the thing is, I bet he's had other lesser kneelings on the neck. You know, to use up horrendous current metaphor because people would say oh what about your career you're going nowhere you're living in a heart you're going mad so you have you have all these things from society that are coming in and taking you away from what what you your intention is so you're being knelt on one way or another you know even if it's only in fact people thinking thinking you're absolutely stupid and you're relatives not wanting to have anything to do with you anymore. I mean, a bit like when Guy McPherson talked about when he left his very privileged position at the university and decided to go off grid. Um, he talks about losing a lot of friends and losing, uh, you know, his family disagreeing with him, people being very, very annoyed at him for doing that. So even as this very privileged white professor. He he. There was there was a loss to it. There was not as great as for somebody who's more oppressed in society. But there's definitely always a loss, isn't there? There's a giving up. But we've got the Buddhist tradition with people going, you know, leaving all possessions and going around with a, with a little bowl, a begging bowl. Uh, we've got in our Western culture, we've got gap year which could be, if it's not too busy, could be seen as a mini version of it. And you've got the Amish, the Amish community, they, they've got the, is it called Hot Springer or Hum Springer or something, or Humdinger when the teenager goes off to discover what they really want. So we have little portions of it. 
in in our cultures in our, in our various cultures yeah good good point we we do have little portions of it or certain cultures like you like you mentioned uh the amish and i was mentioning the aborigines in australia i would say that in our culture generally yes that's true you're not given it you have to take it but there are cultures where it is given to you it's a birthright right like the amish like the aborigines and i'm sure there's myriad others um probably you know indigenous first nations cultures uh that many have not heard about um but i i really think it is you know a, a birthright and um you know whether it's given to you or whether you have to take it makes a big difference someone like will tuttle with the privilege and the self-confidence to just go ahead and take it right um you know having you know a wealthy father to fall back on etc cetera, etc cetera, but just going and doing it anyway that's that's one thing but it's not just there for the taking for everyone that's the point i'm making like i made a few minutes ago but we all need it that's my point and of course that's part of a more general trend there's so many things that we all need um that we're deprived of and we're born into captivity per guy mcpherson uh love that expression um and um so i think um you know i'm actually really excited to share this video i recorded last night that i mentioned so we'll get to that but um i i one of the things i mentioned in the video is that we since we have been so harmed by you know it, it's an interesting sort of duality i mean i could i could look at um uh you know western culture colonizer culture etc and i'm a product of that culture right um and i'm both ashamed of that and because that really from one lens that makes me the perpetrator right um i remember when i when i went to standing rock um uh traveling with uh indigenous friends of mine from south dakota we went up there together and it was a beautiful experience overall and um when and then a group um from uh, black lives matter arrived and um there was uh among them was fred hampton jr the the son of legendary fred hampton from the chicago black panthers who at age 20 was leading the chicago black panthers and really doing revolutionary things and i was just so excited to meet his son he had been murdered um while his son was still in the womb um fred hampton was murdered and so i was talking with him and there was a woman leader there from black lives matter who just didn't want to hear anything from me was just all about shutting me down diminishing me because i'm you know because i'm white and um that was um very frustrating and so but i i can certainly see that perspective right if you know if uh my dad were killed in a japanese concentration camp heaven forbid he wasn't and I was a prisoner over there. I mean, I would be very much afraid of the Japanese as, as you know, so many folks were in the 1940s and whatnot. My dad told me stories about how they were just perceived as just this evil race. Um, and uh, so, you know, I definitely get both sides of it. So, you know, I am at once a representative of the perpetrators of these great evils, but at the same time a victim. Um, because we're all born into this captivity, like a young Spartan soldier born in ancient Greece. Go, go ahead, Melissa. Mm -hmm. um, there's just such a complex 
story. And um, I lived with a Native American man for 14 years and um, got very deep into their cultural wound. The whole history of what hap has happened in this, on this continent with First Nations peoples and the genocide. And um, where I've arrived at is um, we need to, to now move into a place of compassion and get out of victim, being the victims, and thinking of ourselves as bad or perpetrators. In order to create a world that's equitable and that's compassionate, we have to make this change. Um, while we can understand the trauma, and trauma is a big deal, and I don't know if those who've been traumatized by suppression and genocide and other things uh, can in this lifetime actually heal. I mean, there is a possibility, depends on each individual, but I think for all of us moving forward, um, it's really important to um, be mindful and address these things and speak up about inequities and what, for example, what's going on now, um, but not suppress ourselves in the process, regardless of what color we are. It's a vicious circle otherwise, and I've experienced it. So I'm speaking firsthand. This, for me, it's not an intellectual process. For me, it's real, um, having lived it over and out. Thank you, sweetheart. Thank you. And welcome, James from Ireland. How you doing there, James? All right, Jim. How's it going? All right, hello, everybody. Carry on, carry on. Sorry, I'm late as usual. No, no, don't worry about it. I'm just so grateful you're here. Um, is that you raising your hand, Emory? Or you're probably just waving to James. That's cool. All right. Um, the son of the murdered African-American, Lloyd's brother, sorry, not his son, his brother spoke yesterday and it was a very incredible talk that he gave. And he said, if you're angry, don't go around looting and hurting people and property. Use your anger to motivate you to do loving acts to bring about change. And I, I think this is correct what he said. There's a lot of wisdom in that. Use anger to create change, not to hurt others. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. All righty. Well, speaking of uh, creating change, um, you know, as we as we grapple with all there is to grapple with, um, what I always come back to is what can we do? Not just the we who are here now, but the big we of humanity, and what little domino can we knock over that will set in motion a cast, an exponential uh, series of dominoes to get to the really big dominoes ahead, you know, down the road? And how can we make that down the road, not too far down the road, but a lot closer? So basically, what is that silver bullet strategy? Not singular silver bullet solution, but broader holistic silver bullet strategy that can that can get us there, that can get us to safety. And with that question in mind, which for me is the burning question um, as I move through life at this stage, um, what is that silver bullet strategy? That's what I think about like all the time. What do we, <laughs> I mean, virtually all the time. Um, and, um, 
it was with thank you sweetheart and it was it was with that in mind uh, that i recorded the video last night which i'm excited to share but emory you've raised your hand go for it emory i think it's all about bringing about awareness you know it's that's i think that's the ultimate uh ultimate work ahead is 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 to bring about absolute awareness because if you don't know that you don't know if you don't know that you don't know how are you ever gonna know right i mean you went you you did that that work uh you know already you went through what the 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 knowing and the what you know and what you don't know and how that how that works okay so you know i think that's the key is 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 to bring about awareness and uh and that'll set the dominoes that'll set the, that'll that'll start working it has to it's just physics Yeah. Yeah. And um, awareness, um, when I hear awareness, I think like two big things. One is awareness of the problems, but then there, another very important one. Um, and this is where I think Guy McPherson and a lot of his following are missing the boat is awareness of solutions. So that's the full awareness because a lot of people get the Guy McPherson message. They're aware of that. And they basically say, okay, there's my off ramp from the highway of responsibility. There's nothing to do. It's all over. We're all going to die. Subtext. Therefore I can now do whatever I want because it doesn't matter. Right. Um, and So when I hear awareness, I think full spectrum awareness of the problems and of the solutions such as they are. Um, and I think, that's a, I think that's a reason a lot of people avoid the conversation about solutions is if they see that there actually is a solution or are solutions that they might be able to do something about, well, then suddenly there's some response, there's an implied responsibility there, right? And a lot of folks are not comfortable with taking on new responsibilities. It's a lot easier to say that, oh, that's, that's someone else's job. Um, uh, Jayman, yeah. I, I felt with, uh, I don't know how the followers of Guy McPherson take it on, but I felt that Guy McPherson had stopped in the kind of acceptance phase of where we are in terms of the planet. And he's made it his kind of mission to tell that truth. People can go on with it. They can go and drink themselves silly at the end of it if they like, or they can, or they can um, be nice to their families. Is one of the things he suggests, or live um, purposefully and meaningfully every day because they know about it. But I felt that he'd taken on as his mission, kind of telling the truth. But then on top of that, now it's developed into kind of grieving workshops, um, which I, I think is valid. You know, I, I went to a deaf cafe. I don't know if you know about the deaf cafe movement. It's where people talk about death. They might be, they might have anxiety about death. They might have a relative that's recently died. They might have been given a death sentence from the doctor. They might all kinds of stuff to do with death and they're not allowed to talk about it because we've got a taboo in our culture. So um, basically you organize these deaf cafes, there's a deaf cafe movement. Anyone can do one, but they've got like a template online, you know, to give people help and you can invite someone along. And we have this person leading the way. And actually I have to say, it was one of the most fun events I ever went to. Everybody was laughing a lot at this, um, death thing. So I think with Guy McPherson, he's taken that chunk 
and then if you remember the other day you played the Roger Hallam uh, video or James did sorry James did it and it was it was somebody who's setting himself up as a post doomer it, it was the post doom discussion so beyond Guy McPherson you've got the post doom and then you've got the solutionaries and you've got I, I don't think they're um they're, they're a wrong they're a they're a chunk of the journey a piece of the journey and I think this is another piece you know it might be you know it's farther on from post doom it might be the next step or two steps from it so I don't think it it's like if I hadn't come across um, Guy McPherson's conversation, I wouldn't be in this conversation. You know, I think it it's all part of it. You know. Yeah, that's a really good point. So. Hmm. yeah that it's 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 a progression and just because someone is in a, a particular space right now of oh i've just gotten the guy mcpherson message therefore i'm gonna just gonna sit with that for a while that's okay right if that's part of their progression um what i have a problem with is when people just stay there and like for example the first time i worked with guy mcpherson was in 2017 in a tour in california that that I hosted him for and we after the big Sierra Club dinner which was kind of the central event um, we went on to do some other events and interviews and one of those was it was a meeting in Oakland California um, with essentially a Guy McPherson support group kind of thing uh, that had come together after hearing Guy McPherson's message and when I and another colleague Peter were there talking about solutions and whatnot this one guy in the group uh, got angry with us and basically said, wake up, you, you guys, you know, you hopium addicts. There's no solution. It's over, right? It was, it was upsetting for him to hear that perspective that there are solutions or can be solutions. And I think it gets to the heart of what I talked about a few minutes ago. Yeah, but I, I, I think there's some people, I don't want to be down on them, but they're excited by we're all going to, you know, like these disaster movies, we're all going down. <laughs> some people are very excited by that narrative. Maybe it's an inner suicidal thing. Maybe it's uh, they feel that the planet is so co corrupt and awful and horrendous that they, they have a wish for it to all blow up. So I think there's a little bit of that in the people who are like that. I call it extinction delirium. You've got the extinction rebellion. That that's that group are called the extinction delirium group. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean part of it for me. So, and I'll admit, there's part of me that I mean it just looks forward to this craziness just being over, right? Like, you know, there are times when it just, it feels like death would be better than this, right? And so I think, I think so many of us are just so fed up, right? We just want it to be over. And, um, but for me, the way out of this, you know, the way out, the only way out is through, um, and a familiar quote. Well, I don't know how familiar, but anyway, I'm not the one who came up with it. Yes, Emery, go for it. Well, you know what Guy uh, says a lot after a lot of his uh, a lot of his um, videos. You know, he always he always ends it off with at the end. At the edge of extinction, only love remains. You know, now only love remains. But you know, what does that mean for for uh, for everybody? You know, for you know, like, does it mean the same thing 
for for you does it mean you know like you look at the next person you see, the people around you does it mean the same thing that that only love remains in uh, with you uh, you know that's it's a tough it's a tough thing to uh, to accept that only love remains you know i mean it really uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's i you know you want to be loving don't misunderstand and then I am loving. Uh, that's my nature, you know, to, to, to be loving and caring. And, but um, to have that, to confront that concept, that, that that's all that's left now, right? That in itself, I tell you, it's not, not, uh, not easy to swallow. got to do, you know, got to do something more. Yeah. Mm. Well, I was looking at, um, looking at a talk there, and I was well there, and I was the other day, there was um, John Doyle, the Irish, he's the, the UN Foresight, he's with the UN Foresight Group. He he done it, another talk there um, with uh, Stuart Scott there a couple of weeks back as well. But he was talking with Jim Ben Jim Bendel in this talk now actually and uh, kind of um, talking deep adaptation and things like that. And during the talk or at the start of the talk with him, he actually said like that um, prior to the. COVID situation of us, all, of, of us being alive in the next 15, 20 years was at about 0%. And he's works for, you know, he's UN foresight. Like, and, and, and then, you know, the, the, all of the people in the know, he said, are in the know, but what can you do? Because, but like, in, in other words, what can you do? Because there's no um, congealing, there's no getting everybody on board with the actual facts. And, and I hope, you know, solutions and de dealing with it but he sees now that the arrival of the covid as devastating and tragic as it is he sees it as maybe a light in the at the end of the tunnel and maybe maybe just a way for us out of the you know for us to sit back and uh, and and think like whoa what the fuck's happening in the world like and uh, you know some time to contemplate on what's going on what the real issues are like so he He's hoping like that. Well, not hoping this was, but he's he's just seeing that that's that's showing him that there is a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel in an otherwise you know pitch black tunnel that he was uh, viewing it as before prior to the COVID. But um, yeah, I can understand the lot like the lot of the guy McPherson followers and he tells it like it is. We can't, no matter how much of um, no matter how much how much in enthusiasm or, or uh, positivity we have about trying to come up with solutions, we still can't deny it to ourselves that it still is what it is at the moment. But you know, that is of course why you, I mean the you know like Emery he gets I I can see he's been getting upset a couple of times in a number of weeks there now because of the urgency of it, and I can understand that we all do. Um, it, it's a case of on and off with that kind of stuff. You get on with it for a while, and then you, you it all comes crowding around you. But um, it, regardless, we we can either you know we can either wallow it in, in it and accept it like the guy makes there some followers, or we can just turn around and say, right, I'm not going down with all the fight here anyway. Like so, we got to do something, and that's the only choice we have as far as I'm concerned. But regardless of how futile anyone thinks it is. Or regardless of how many other the percentage doesn't even know it's happening, we just have to keep fighting because that's the way I see it. Anyway, regardless of how futile it might seem to anyone, just have to try and find solutions. Simple and plain. And as Emery said, we have to create awareness, overall awareness among the general public, because I think until the general public are on board, there's no hope of anything happening. 
Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Yep, good stuff. Good stuff. All right. Well, we're about two hours in. Um, I'd like to relocate to outside and I'm excited to play the video that I recorded last night that I sent the link to in the email. Um, uh, screen share and do that. Uh, but first, uh, how are people feeling about a, a break? Should we take a few minute break? How long would be good? How long a break do you do people want? I'm easy with anything, so I'll just leave it up to yourselves. I just not, not here long anyway, so I'll leave it up to yourselves and go along with anything. Okay. Emery says, at least 13 minutes. Now you got me curious. What does it take 13 minutes to do? But anyway, no, I'm just kidding. No, that sounds good. Why don't we break till like, say, quarter after, you know, and if you need a couple more minutes, no problem. And then maybe at about 20 after, we can start the recording. Uh, or, I mean, we can start again. Okay, I'm gonna pause recording.